And boom. Okay, well, good afternoon again. Good morning, whatever time it is that you're watching this. Uh, this is the last day or the last time that we'll uh, be in the book of Jonah. And hopefully I'm getting a little better at this uh, video stuff. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, get into our lesson. We're in the book of Jonah. Uh, we'll read through uh, chapter 3 and spend a lot of time more in chapter 4 as 3 kind of leads us into that. We've already seen Jonah uh, called to God to go to Nineveh. And he ran the other way, took a ship, uh, storm came, thrown out of the ship, ended up swallowed by a fish. Uh, he gets uh, throat, the fish throws him up uh, onto the shore. And then we come into uh, chapter 3. And so he's... Uh, comes to him the second time. Verse uh, chapter 3 says uh, in Jonah, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Now it talks about in verse 3 that the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, uh, I'm pretty sure that it, it probably didn't come within the next couple days after he got uh, thrown up by the fish. Most likely it was a uh, little time after that, uh, whether it was a month or a week or maybe even longer than that, uh, as God allowed what had happened to kind of settle into Jonah and get him to think about it and uh, get his strength back up and to think of what he should learn, what God wanted him to learn uh, during that time. Now the other thing is, is when Jonah goes to preach, he says that in 40 days, uh, God is going to destroy Nineveh. And so there's a good chance that, that God had already gave him that message the first time when he told him to go there and preach. And so there's also the possibility that maybe Jonah's thinking, you know, if, if I wait later, then, uh, you know, when 40 days is up, you know, they're gone. Uh, but uh, what we see is that this starts at the time that he gets to Nineveh, and then God sets the clock. It's not when he came to Jonah, but when, when he gets to Nineveh. Uh, so, uh, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word, so they had done this, and now this tells us why they had done it. Uh, for word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So, uh, this has hit him, the king, so hard that he realizes that somehow he realized that Jonah is actually a real prophet from God and uh, that this catastrophe is going to come. And so he turns and he, he wants, uh, he's looking to uh, see if he could uh, divert this thing from happening, this judgment from coming. And so not only his nobles, but he tells the people and he even says, don't even let your uh, uh, animals have any water or food during this time and, and let's all just you know, pray to God and not eat fast and uh, see what will happen. Uh, he says in verse 9, oh in verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. And then verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent? and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. So Nineveh, this wicked city, had decided, the king on down had decided that, you know, this is probably going to happen. They believed what Jonah was saying, and so they decided that they would fast, and not only fast, not only uh, uh, that they, they were also uh, going to change their ways. They were going to repent and change their ways and not do violence. 
and uh, try to do good. So even though Jonah's sermon seemed very short, you know, 40 days and God's going to destroy the city, uh, they believed it and uh, they began to work to see if, if, if God would be merciful to them. Uh, just like the sailors, you know, in chapter 1, uh, they turned to God uh, after Jonah explained who he was and what he had done, and they began to pray to God. And so in the story, we have the Gentile uh, sailors praying to God, repenting of what they were doing, and then now you have Nineveh doing the same thing. And at the same time, we have the same problem with, with what's in Jonah's heart. Uh, he's not repenting of this, of his attitude, and also Israel. You know, the whole thing is Israel, even though God has sent prophets to them, even everything that God had done for them, they would not repent. And so this is a contrast uh, between the Gentiles, who in this case, when God comes to them, they repent, and yet Israel uh, isn't willing to repent. And I believe Jonah is the, the, the picture of, of Israel in this. And then verse 4 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. I mean, Jonah was really upset. I mean, he was, you know, he was madder than someone cutting him off in traffic. Uh, he was madder than three or four people cutting him off in traffic. I mean, he had had it. This was it. Uh, it not only displeased him exceedingly, but he was very angry. Now, think of this. What was it that displeased Jonah? What was it that made him very angry? It was because they repented. Because what he was afraid of, that he would come to them, he would preach, and they would see what was, what was the judgment that was coming, and they would turn to God and they would repent, and that's what he saw. You know, God hadn't answered yet, but he saw that they were repenting, and that upset him. You know, it was kind of opposite. You know, when God uh, uh, spoke to Abraham and said that he was going to uh, judge Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, what did Abraham do? Abraham began to pray. He began to petition God, you know, that, that he wouldn't destroy it. You know, if there's ten righteous and, and all the way down, you know, trying to get him to, to uh, show remorse, you know, to, to repent of that, you know, hopefully to find people that were, that were righteous enough that God would, would change his mind and he wouldn't uh, destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet, here with Jonah, he's totally opposite of that. I mean, he's, because they repented, he's angry. Matter of fact, this is what we see is that Jonah was unwilling to hold out the same chance of repentance for Nineveh that God had offered to him while he was at, at sea when he was swallowed uh, by the uh, fish. So he, was, he prayed to God in repentance, wanting God to save him, and yet here when Nineveh repents and turns to God, I mean, then that brings anger, you know, because they were, as far as he was concerned, was their enemy. Uh, excuse me, that's verse 1 of chapter 4. I think I said verse 4. Uh, but that would have been uh, chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And so now in verse 2, it says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? You know, when I was in Israel? Therefore I fled before unto Tarsus. For I knew thou art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. In other words, he, that if people repent, then, then God will, will turn from judgment on them. And so he's upset because God looks at repentance and turns around and, and is gracious and, and slow to anger when people are, are willing to repent, when people are willing to turn to him. And Jonah doesn't have a problem with when he repents, you know, for God to be gracious, but his problem is with Nineveh. 
or with, with, with the Gentiles, with, with the enemy of what he considers the enemy of Israel. You would think that when Jonah saw the repentance in Nineveh, that man, he would be full of joy. You know, that, that, that you know, he had preached and, and the whole city had turned to God and he would be real excited about that. But we see that he's full of, he's, he's full of rage. You know, he just can't handle it. And so we, we, get a, we get a look at Jonah's condition, his spiritual condition at this time, how, how much he knows about God, but he's not willing to be an example or to, to, to use that out toward those that, that, that he's upset with or that the people that he don't like. I mean, he, it's almost like he's trying to hide this from them. And so he understands who God is. He understands that God is merciful. And yet he's, he's not wanting to, to see Nineveh uh, repent and come, and, and come to know God. And, you know, a lot of times if we're not careful in our life, you know, we, we do the same thing. We get upset with people and angry, and we show the anger. And even if, if they say they're sorry, you know, we, we really don't want to accept it. We don't want to believe they're really sorry because we want to be able to make them hurt like they made us hurt. And so here we see that Jonah had his theology right. You know, God is gracious. He's merciful, he's slow to anger, he's full of kindness. And so what Jonah said to God at this time, what he quoted came from Moses uh, back in Exodus. In Exodus 34, 6, where uh, it says, And the Lord passed by before him, talking about Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, this is the central expression of God's character that we see. Uh, we see this quoted in Numbers 14, uh, again in Nehemiah 9, uh, three times in Psalms, in Psalms 86, Psalms 103, and Psalms 145, and then lastly in Joel chapter 2, uh, it talks and it shows, the, it expresses God's character as far as being forgiving and merciful and slow to anger. And yet Jonah was not willing to accept this for the Ninevites. But you know, a lot of times it's, that can be, a lot of times that's human nature. You know, we like to, to, uh, to launch out, to be angry or, or to, to show anger with people that, that have hurt us or, or that we disagree with. And, and we don't like to see good things happen to them. You know, when I was up country in the village up there, you know, I remember as we uh, were working to bring water down to the top part of the village from another mountain, we are laying pipe down and, and then working on not only getting it into the tanks there by the church, but down to the houses. And, and so we didn't have enough money to be able to help each villager, you know, up there at that time. Uh, but based on what we brought in monthly, we could help so many, we figured out we could help so many people each month until we were able to cover you know, all of them to help each one of them out with the, getting the water to their house themselves. And so we started that. The first month came and we took that money aside and, and we started working on that. And some of the people uh, began to want us to do the same at their house. We said, well, we're, you know, we explained to them, we're gonna do this section of the village first Next month we'll do this section, and the fall month we'll do this section, the next month we'll do this one, and in four months we should have it covered. And, and the people that weren't on the top of the list at number one, they got upset. You know, and, and uh, as we begin to talk to them, saying, hey, you know, we're gonna, everyone's gonna, you know, we're gonna be able to help everyone. And their whole deal was, if you can't help us all right now, then don't help any of us. And it's like, so you want us to wait until we get four months, you know, and, and they're like, yeah, you know, because they didn't want other people to get ahead of them, to get it done. Uh, matter of fact, we had a, a medical clinic and uh, we set it up, you know, the medical clinic in the village and, and set up that where we had a, a room where the lost would go in there and, and they would be witness to, uh, they'd give them the plan of salvation, they'd give them a couple uh, gifts like toothpaste and toothbrushes, stuff like that. 
and then they'd go in to uh, see the nurse and the doctors of uh, what their problems were. And some of the, the deal was is that because we wanted to be sure we had enough stuff to give to those that we had invited the loss, you know, we were telling the Christians that, you know, this is, this is the room where we're witnessing to the loss, and so it's just for them. But because we were giving out toothpaste and toothbrushes to these people that went in there, then they wanted to go in there. And, uh, we, you know, we were explaining to them, you know, we weren't sure, you know, we think we have enough for everyone, but just in case we want the loss to be sure they get it, you know, so that we have the chances to uh, witness to them. And some of the Christians got upset. They wanted to go in there with them, you know, so that they, they could get the, uh, the free stuff. And uh, some of them, I mean, they came to me and they're like, well, you know, if we can't go in there and get it with them, then what good is it being a Christian? You know, and so they were looking at their own selfish desires first, you know, more important than getting the lost in there so that we could witness to them and, and have a chance for them to accept Christ. And so the problem was in their heart. You know, they were looking at, at things that they could get more than they were looking at the souls of these that had opportunity to go in and hear the Word of God. And basically, you kind of have the same thing with Jonah. You know, here's a chance for uh, the Ninevites to trust God and, and to repent. And yet, he's looking, you know, at what Nineveh had done to, to Israel before and, and what he was afraid they were going to do in the end. And so... Uh, he was against God showing mercy to them. And so that's what we mean. You know, he had his theology right, but it was basically for, for him and for his people, you know, not for others. So what we see in, 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 the, in verse 2 there is that, God, that Jonah knew God's character all along. He knew who God was. He knew... Uh, uh, about his character, uh, what could happen, and that's what he was afraid of. And the problem with Jonah was that he couldn't comprehend God's actions. You know, he, in believing instead that divine mercy should be extended to Israel's enemies, he just, he couldn't hold to that. He couldn't see God work in the lives of Israel's enemies, those that wanted to destroy uh, Israel. And he preferred that God would destroy Israel's enemies who had already ransacked, uh, ransacked uh, Israel, uh, Israel already. So he wanted basically to see them burn. You know? He wanted to see God judge them for what they had already done. So in this aspect, God's divine compassion did not fit in Jonah's mind. You know, this was something that, that God would extend to Israel, that God would extend to, to, to those that, that God had called to be his, his, his nation, but not to those that were their enemies. See, Jonah had forgotten. He just never quite realized that he too was already unworthy of God's mercy and that he had ran away from God when God had first told him to, to go to Nineveh. And yet God had extended his mercy in the fish and brought him back so that he could continue to be God's prophet. And it's the same way of Israel. You know, as, as Israel was constantly the subject of God's mercy, they kept turning their back on it. Now that God had spared Nineveh, and this was, this was Jonah's, Jonah's attitude, his thinking was, now that God had spared Nineveh, then God could use Nineveh as his instrument to chastise Israel because Israel wasn't repenting. There was no hint of any kind of national repentance in Israel. Much less like we, we saw what, what had happened in Nineveh with the king and the people there. And so this was, was making Jonah probably angrier as he looked at this. So verse 3, uh, chapter 4, Jonah says, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And so he just tells God, you know, I'm just, you know this, this is what I was afraid of, that Nineveh would repent, and you wouldn't judge them, and so just kill me. I'm tired. I don't, I don't, I don't even want to know what's going to happen now. Just kill me. In verse 4, then said the Lord, dost thou well to be angry? You know, God's question about this is, 
is to have Jonah look to, to see that about God's sovereignty. You know, God is sovereign. God is going to do what God's going to do. You know, God has a plan, and God's going to work out that plan. And so he turns, God turns to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry? You know, you're angry at me? You know, because, you know, I can show mercy and grace to these people? You know, that's my prerogative. You know, whether God judges sin or he holds off and he's slow to anger, that's God's prerogative. You know, Jonah got a second chance. God does not, or Jonah got a second chance from God. God does not have to give anyone a second chance. When we sin, then we're under God's judgment. It's just God's mercy and, and his compassion, his slow to anger that he gives us a second chance. But God's not obligated to do that. You know, it's up to God. He decides on how he's going to do it and what he's going to do. So Jonah was so disgusted at the outcome of his preaching that he asked God to take his life. I mean, he's mad because they listened to his preaching and they repented. And so he says, just kill me. But the neat thing was, as we see, just as God was patient with the Ninevites, God is here patient with Jonah. And that's why he asked him, doest thou well to be angry? You know, what wonderful proof that God is as Jonah had just described him. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. I mean, if it would have been me or a lesser God, would have answered Jonah's prayer at once and just killed him on the spot. Just put an end to him. If that's what you want, I'll do it. You know, I mean, how many times growing up, you know, do you, you, you know, see kids get in an argument and one of them will say, just hit me, just hit me. And all of a sudden, the guy will just hit him. And they'll say, why'd you hit him? Well, he told me to. He asked me to. And so God, so Jonah asked God, just kill me. So God asked him, should you be angry? I mean, is there a reason for you to be angry at me? I mean, God has, has a lot of questions. When you go through the Bible looking at the questions that God has, you know, asking, you know, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was at. You know, when he asked Cain, where's your brother? You know, and so here, you know, he goes, why are you angry? He's got a reason for these questions. Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city. We have, we have no answer from Jonah on this. He goes out of the city to the east side of the city and there made him a booth. And he sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. So probably Jonah goes outside the city. He sees Nineveh repenting. And so he's angry because Nineveh is repenting. Now, how many of the 40 days has come by, we don't know. The Bible's silent on that. But I think what we have here, the reason Jonah goes outside and then he builds him a little booth to sit under is because he's waiting for that 40 days and he's going to see if God's going to judge it, uh, God's going to judge Nineveh or not. You know, that's the whole attitude. He, he sees them repenting and it makes him angry. He can't handle because he knows that with them repenting, God just might be gracious to them and not judge them. And so he goes outside the city and he probably finds uh, uh, so, uh, trees and, or some branches and probably coming up, and they kind of veer out at the top. He cuts them and he sticks the poles down in the ground uh, with the V's up. Then he takes some sticks and lays them across the top of that might use some grass to tie them together. And uh, then he takes uh, uh, branches, large leaves, and puts over the top. Most likely, the booth that he built made shadow, but it probably didn't keep all the sun out. And it's mainly, it's probably open around the, the, the ends. It was just some shade over the top. And, but it wasn't a lot. And so he sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what would become of the city. So he's upset because they've repented, and now he's going to sit and see, would judgment come? And so what's God do? Well, you know, God has been trying to teach Jonah some lessons, 
and he hasn't wanted to, to learn them yet. And this is one of the things is, you know, it's when you, you know, you ever notice that in school sometimes you keep taking the same test over again until you pass it. You know, you take it, you flunk it, teacher gives it to you again, you know. And uh, a lot of times in our life we think, why does this keep happening to me? Well, it could be because God's trying to get you to pass the test and you haven't passed the test yet. And so the same problem keeps coming about because you keep flunking the test. And God's trying to get you to pass that test. And so here he is. God is still working in Jonah's life trying to get him to see the error of his way and to pass the test. Now notice this in verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head and uh, to deliver him from his grief. Now notice this, that, that Jonah is angry at God. He's sitting there. He's wanting to see Nineveh punished. He wants to see the judgment, the fire come down from heaven, the earthquake, the swallow, whatever it was. That's what he's waiting for. You remember... You know, James and John, you know, when they asked Jesus, you know, about the cities that weren't listening, and they said, should we call down fire from heaven and devour them? You know, I mean, that's Jonah, you know. And so a gourd comes up, and all we know is it says God prepared a gourd. So uh, exactly there's different things they, that people think it is. Uh, is probably whatever it was was uh, uh, had probably large leaves to be able to shadow uh, the area he was at. It came up over the night, shadowed the whole top of it, uh, so it probably leaned over in that direction uh, to uh, give him better uh, uh, a better shadow and and to make it a little cooler there. And it says God did this why to deliver him from his grief, you know. So here he is angry with God and God's. Still gracious to him. You know, God is, is still showing him mercy. God is, is wanting to be a blessing to him, to help him out. Trying to, to be good that, that Jonah would see the error of his way and he was going to have a change of heart. The same thing he'd been doing to Israel. And it even says right here at the end of the verse, verse 6 it says, So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Now when it says exceeding glad, what it's saying is that Jonah rejoiced with great rejoicing. I mean, I mean he, it wasn't just that this, this plant came up to give him shadow, uh, to, to make it cooler. I mean, he was exceeding glad for it. I mean, he rejoiced. He knew that God had brought this plant to him to give him shade. So for one day, he had it. And then verse 8, And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a, uh, excuse me, verse 7, But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. So by the next morning that night, a worm comes up, and God had prepared this worm, and he probably attacked the root system, the stem, uh, there at the base of the, the plant. And whether he ate through the plant to cause it to, to probably topple over on top of his uh, uh, booth that he had built, or whether it just withered it, kept withered it up, uh, we're really not sure. I mean, we know it withered, but whether it just fell over on top of the the uh, uh, place there, or it just kept the moisture from getting up there. And so it says God prepared the worm. And in verse 8 it says, And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And so God prepared the gourd, the plant. God prepared the worm. And now he prepared this, this east wind uh, there in the Middle East uh, coming out of the east uh, through the desert. Uh, vehement east wind. It's a type of wind that just kind of sucks the life out of everything. It's, it's very hot. Uh, in West Texas, you know, we'd get this. Uh, when it got real hot and the wind, instead of being a cool breeze, was a very hot breeze. Uh, if you were, uh, uh, during that time when it was very hot, if you were in a parking lot, you know, that was asphalt or cement, and, and just for, just a huge parking lot, and you're walking in the middle of that parking lot, and the heat's reflecting off the asphalt, 
Uh, it's reflecting, you know, off the cement, and then you got that hot wind. I mean, it just saps the, the strength out of you. It just, your, your skin gets dry. Uh, it's just the breathing. You just you feel that heat going into you. And so this is probably uh, what he is facing, except even more, more than that, uh, because this one was prepared by God. And so it was, it, and it says, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah. So God had, had withered the plants, everything above Jonah, and now this east wind was, was coming through there. The sun was beating down on his head. The wind was really hot, and that was sapping his strength. It says that he fainted. Kind of like when he was in the, the fish, swallowed by the fish, you know. And he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Now let's focus on Jonah for a minute in this situation. I mean, all he's got to do is get up and make, try to find some more branches or leaves, you know, to put over his hut or to move to another location. But he is so focused on waiting to see if God's going to judge Nineveh that, I mean, he's not willing to move. And he just sits there with the sun beating down on him and, and he's just saying, you know, I'm going to stay here until God does something. You know, I'm, if, if he's not going to judge, then I'm going to be here till I'm dead. God just kill me. It's it. I've had it. You see, for Jonah, everything was going, going wrong. You know, this was the worst possible thing that could come about. Nineveh had been granted a reprieve. I mean, that meant bad for Israel in the future. Uh, God could use Assyria to come in and, and to uh, uh, take Israel away, uh, which he was going to do. Uh, the gourd that had given him such satisfaction had been killed by the miserable worm. And then on top of that, this east wind had come in and, and begin to, to sap his strength away. So when we look at Jonah, we just see sadness and anger in his life. I mean, to where he's, not, he's, just, he's not willing to do anything but sit and wait to see if God judges Nineveh. If not, I'm just going to sit here and suffer until I die. Just kill me, Lord. I'm tired of it. You know, sometimes Christians do the same thing. You know, we get more upset over a plant or a flower or, you know, something that we planted that dies or somebody runs over it with a bicycle or kicks it over than we are for our neighbors, our friends, or even family that don't know Christ and heading into a lost eternity. And so here Jonah is basically, he's more upset about that plant that's died now uh, uh, than he was worried about the Ninevites, you know, being cast into hell, uh, being judged. So verse 9, And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. So now Jonah has been angry with God because Nineveh had repented. And now... God brings up this gourd to help give him shade, and then the next day it's dead, and he's even more angry at God. I mean, he's, his anger has now turned to that gourd against the worm for killing the gourd and, and to causing um, more anxiety and more suffering in his own life. He's more worried about the suffering that he has because there's no shade in that east wind on him than he is about Nineveh. Verse 10, 11. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And so he says, you know, you didn't labor, you didn't, you didn't take care of it at all, there was nothing you did to plant it, to, to bring it up, uh, you didn't take care of it, it came up in a night, and it was dead in a night. It just lasted for one day. And you're more upset over that then verse 11, 
And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons, 120,000 people that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? And so God says, you know, you're more worried about that gourd that brought you comfort than you are about the Ninevites. Well, I'm more worried about the Ninevites than I am against that plant. Jonah was pleased for the plant, but when it died, he wanted to die. So God is questioning Jonah's anger. Yeah. He could see no further than his own discomfort. I mean, he wasn't even willing to get up and look for more shade. He was just going to sit there and die. And so God comes to the point. Jonah had got even more upset over that plant and an insignificant single plant. And yet God was more, you know, cared more, was more concerned about the people in Nineveh that were repenting and and, and turning uh, from their wicked way. And the sad thing is, is the book just ends there. You know, we don't don't know if, if Jonah repents or what? It just ends right there. Uh, and it's left that way, I, I think, before our own questions to see, what about us? You know, where do we stand in this? Uh, it, it ends that way as an example for, for Israel, you know, uh, which I think is the focus, the main focus of the book is, is toward Israel to show, you know, how God has done everything that he can uh, trying to bring Israel along You know, he brought them out of Egypt. Uh, He did miracles uh, galore. Uh, He gave them the word of God. He gave them prophets to try to get them to to see. Uh, He brought calamities upon them to get them to repent, to come to him. He brought mercy and blessings to them to to try to get them to, to look to him. And nothing was working. All this that he had done trying to bring them up with, even with, with showing with Hosea, you know, that that Israel was, was like his bride that had turned from him and, and played the harlot following other gods and, and he was trying to get her back. Even though she was going into, into slavery, she just didn't want to turn. And that's where Israel was headed. If they didn't go into slavery, then, then Assyria would end up coming in, uh, would defeat them, would take them captive, and would take them away into slavery. And that's where they were headed. And so here, God is trying to get Israel to see their own life in correlation with Jonah and what's what's going on in Jonah's life. And Jonah, he wanted Jonah to see, you know, the correlation of his life with the nation Israel themselves. And then I think he wants us to to be sure that, that, you know, we don't get caught up in the same attitude, you know, where we're just focused on, on what's best for us and, and what we want, and we begin to, to be more like Jonah, where Jonah was, was very happy for the blessings that God had gave him, you know, in, in the gourd, in the shadow, but not in God himself. You know, when God had blessed him, and then God took it away, he was angry at God again, even more so, for taking that away. And so we need to be sure that, that we're focused on worshiping the, the giver and not the gift itself. And I think it's important for us to think about, you know, in Matthew, uh, we won't go through the whole uh, uh, parable, but we had talked about this on the first uh, uh, day when we looked at the introduction in Matthew 18. Uh, look at Matthew 18, if you will, and we'll end the parable at the very end, in verse 32 and 33, where it says, Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And so this is the the parable where, you know, the uh, master comes to a servant that owes him some money and and he can't pay it, so he's going to throw him in prison and, and sell his wife and kids. And so he begs for mercy and says he will pay it, just give him some more time and so he just not only gives him more time, he forgives the debt. Says, go ahead, you know, don't worry about it. 
And so this same guy that, that got the mercy and the gracious uh, aspect from, from this guy, from his master, goes to another servant that owes him money, and the servant can't pay it, asks for mercy, but instead of giving mercy, he turns him over uh, to the police, and so he's thrown in prison, and his family is, is sold you know, to pay back the money. And So the other servants, when they hear it, they go to the master and say, hey, you know, this guy that you forgave his debt wasn't willing to forgive the other guy's debt. So that's where the master gets upset and tells him, you know, you should have had compassion on him like I did on you. You know, I forgave the little bit that you owed. You know, why couldn't, or the more I, I forgave you for all that you owed, why couldn't you forgive the little bit that he owed? And it's in direct correlation with us. You know, God forgives us of our sins daily, you know. And uh, because of that, because of God's being gracious and merciful and having compassion for us, and we should for other people, and be sure that, that we do that to them. Matter of fact, Ephesians 4.32, Ephesians 4.32 kind of sums it up and says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So, what's the biggest miracle in the book of Jonah? Most people think of the fish that swallowed Jonah and then throws him up. Uh, keeps him from drowning. Uh, some people might say they think it's the Nineveh, the evil city Nineveh that repented and turned to God. But I think the biggest miracle is that God continued to work in Jonah's life trying to get Jonah himself to see his sin and to repent in the same way that he kept he keeps he had kept working with Israel for hundreds of years trying to get them to to see their sin and to repent and to come to him and it kind of sums it up that aspect in Joel chapter 2 so let's read Joel chapter 2 verses 12 and four, through 14 Joel 2 12 through 14 therefore also now saith the Lord Turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? And so here Joel is, is, is the last you know, as he gives the, uh, a prophecy to, to, as he's speaking to Judah, and he tells Judah, hey, you know, repent. You know, come to God. You know, if you do, then he'll change his heart. You know, he'll change his heart. He won't, he won't judge, but he'll turn around and leave a blessing. And, of course, in history we know that... Uh, that doesn't happen. And there's one other verse that I wanted to share. And I thought I had it right here. And I don't. I don't know if I'm going to be able to share this one or not. I might have, it looks like I accidentally uh, erased it. Oh, here we go. Uh, one of the things about Nineveh's repentance, you know, that we're talking about. Uh, let's look, Jesus used the repentance of Nineveh as an example for the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, look in Matthew 12, 41. Matthew 12, 41. Jesus said, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. And of course, Israel, the Pharisees, the scribes, the leaders were not trusting God, were not trusting, were not turning to uh, Jesus as their Messiah. Uh, Luke eleven thirty two 32 uh, basically has the same thing. It says, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. So 
So, the thing is, if you're still alive, then you got a chance to repent. If you're in sin uh, and you're still breathing, then that means that you've got a chance to repent, to come to God, to ask for forgiveness. And if you meet it in your heart, then there's a chance he's, that He's going to forgive you and He's going to give you a blessing. And so as long as we have life in us, there's always the chance that God's going to give us a blessing if we'll just turn to Him. So remember that. Let's pray. Father, thank You for today. Thank You for Your love. Help us, Lord, not to have a critical attitude with others the way Jonah did with the Ninevites, but help us, Lord, to love our enemies as You loved Your enemies and to be a witness to them that they might come to know You as, as their Savior as we know. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.